Today I'm speaking with my friend, Andrew Glover. Andrew is a member of Heterodox Academy, which, if you don't know them, they're an organisation donated to fostering viewpoint diversity in universities. And it was founded by a friend of Quillette, Jonathan Haidt. Andrew has written nine articles for Quillette, but it's been a while since you've written your last one. So you need to write another one soon. Andrew, do you think Australian universities have an issue with viewpoint diversity? Yeah, I do. I think it's one of these issues that has only recently kind of come to light. So Heterodox Academy was founded in 2015 or so, I believe. Uh, And I think it really sort of struck a chord in that it was speaking to something that a lot of people had overlooked. So uh, there's a lot of sort of the university is devoted to promoting gender diversity and ethnic diversity and so on. Uh, but viewpoint diversity is one of these things which, um, you know, it's not quite as visible. You can't see it from looking at people in a photo. Um, and so, but it does sort of get, um, it, it, it affects the way scholarship is done in the universities, the way teaching is done. And it just means that we want to make sure that we have a broad range of viewpoints um, represented in universities Mm -hmm. and in the knowledge they create and the science and the the teaching. So it makes sense to be thinking about are these these organisations as diverse as they can be with regards to the viewpoints that are expressed. So how did you get interested in this topic? What was it that prompted you? So I've been following Jonathan Haidt uh, for a little while, um, read a couple of his early books uh, and found them quite compelling. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I'd, I'd written for Colette as well in the early days as well. And so there's some connections there. Mm-hmm. And I think I just, I, the mission I find really um, valuable. And mm-hmm. I think if, if universities do kind of pay attention to this, it's going to be, it's, we're going to be producing better knowledge, mm-hmm. better teachers, better outcomes, I think. Mm-hmm. I guess, though, going a bit further back, Mm. uh, do you have any experience in academia? Was it something that was personal to you? Not too much. I mean, not not to me personally. I had a fine time in academia. I said out of academia now, Mm. but it wasn't. It's not like I was (laughs) cancelled out of academia. (laughs) Not yet. Not yet. (laughs) But. I did. You know, just through social media and my Mm -hmm. discussions with other academics, Mm -hmm. I did notice that these that this was becoming an issue and mm-hmm. that it was affecting the way people were able to do their jobs, the way people um, were or weren't able to, say, have career progression within mm-hmm. academia. So if they weren't kind of saying the right things, they might not be, you know, getting the grants that they would need to succeed and, mm-hmm. and thrive in their academic roles. Um, so, yeah, I, I do think it's something that I was noticing, although mm-hmm. I didn't personally have a, you know, a terrible experience mm-hmm. or anything like that. So for those of us who haven't worked as an academic, my only experience is as a student, what are some of the things that curtail freedom of thought or freedom of discussion on universities? Yeah, so I think it's that the the group think, really. Mm -hmm. So when you don't, when you aren't surrounded by people who have a broad diversity of views on Mm -hmm. a particular topic, you tend to think that the view that you hold and all your colleagues and collaborators hold is kind of the only valid one. And so it's difficult to get a sense of, of what another perspective might be. And I think we have a tendency to then sort of view those views with suspicion Mm -hmm. and maybe, you know, think about them as as not being legitimate or valuable when there might be valuable perspectives there, even if they don't, they're not ones that you hold. Mm -hmm. So if you have everyone in a faculty, say, or everyone in a classroom or a lecture theatre, thinking broadly along the same lines, then those ideas aren't going to be stress tested to the Mm -hmm. extent that they really need to be if we're going to be producing mm-hmm. good science and good uh, knowledge production. So these have flow on effects into the onto the science that's actually the research that's being conducted. Yeah. Yeah. I, th- I think so. And and that can be everything from the methods, so the mm-hmm. way that you choose to, to go about a research. Mm-hmm. As I said, the, the assumed knowledge that's mm-hmm. there when research is being reviewed, so it yeah. undergoes peer review. Mm-hmm. And if it isn't if it's being reviewed just by people who think like you. Mm-hmm. Like I said, they're not going to critique. They're not going to pick up the the gaps or the faults in that the reasoning that you might mm-hmm. be putting forward mm-hmm. or the methods that you're using to mm-hmm. conduct that research, the assumptions that you're making. Mm-hmm. And as I said, that means that you you're not getting that level of knowledge production mm-hmm. and the quality mm-hmm. that we need from universities. Yeah. Yeah. Now, last time we met, you were telling me about when you apply for a grant to study something, yeah. you um, have to set out, is it 
like your personal history, like who you are, your ethnicity, your sexuality. Is that? Yeah. Really yeah. Could so, you explain that a bit more so to our audience? These are kind of known as diversity statements. Okay. And so when you apply for an academic job, mm -hmm. you obviously you put in an application mm -hmm. and you're going to be, um, you know, putting in your CV and that's going to have your publications and your, your employment history and mm -hmm. so on. And you would obviously be writing also about your your research interests mm -hmm. and what you plan to do in that role. More recently, and this has happened more in the US than mm -hmm. Australia yet, although my understanding is there's some use of these diversity statements, is that you also have to produce a statement where you kind of articulate your commitments to um, to diversity mm -hmm. as it's kind of broadly mm -hmm. understood in mm -hmm. social justice mm -hmm. um, circles. Um, so you have to be kind of framing your your whole kind of mission as an mm -hmm. academic and your research area. You've got to be talking about how you've been essentially pursuing social justice and, and fostering diversity mm -hmm. through that research. So that that's a problem mm -hmm. in that these statements often become more like litmus, political litmus tests for, for academics who are mm -hmm. applying for positions. Mm -hmm. And in some cases, these statements are used as a screening process. So human resource departments in some universities in the US will kind of get a hold of these statements early on, very early on in the application mm -hmm. process. And then they will screen out any candidates that mm -hmm. kind of don't say the right thing in these diversity statements. So already there, you are screening out potential applicants who would be the most qualified mm -hmm. or the best suited for the job. Mm -hmm. But because they don't actually, um, they're, they're not able or they don't want to sort of articulate these uh, statements about diversity because they might have the view that it isn't actually relevant to the job. Yeah. Um, then they're, they're not going to be in the pool of candidates yeah. that's going to get this job. Mm. Do you know if these statements are used across all fields of research? Yeah, my, I mean, my understanding is that in some universities in the US, this is sort of a human resources level thing. So it's for wow. all kind of a, a applications, mm -hmm. particularly academic applications now. If you're looking to become you know, a professor or yeah. any kind of position in the university, you have to kind of produce one of these. Wow. <laughs> Sounds pretty... Pretty messed up. Yeah, I mean, I, I do think it's it's a problem when the job of universities is to mm. be um, hiring people to, mm. to produce knowledge, yeah. and if we're placing constraints on those the people that mm -hmm. are that are taking those positions, mm -hmm. and if they're arguably kind of more political constraints, then mm. that's that's a problem. Yeah. Mm. Okay, what else? Is, what's Heterodox Academy in Australia? What's it up to at the moment? So, I mean, Heterodox Academy Australia isn't a, a formal organisation okay. as such. Mm -hmm. It's um, was sort of a, a a group of us Australian members okay. of Heterodox mm -hmm. Academy. How many? Are um, there more or less? I think we had about fifty or so. Okay. And um, so we had, you know, we would interact on social media. Mm -hmm. But I think a lot of academics who uh, support the mission, mm -hmm. but are who are afraid to mm -hmm. kind of publicly mm -hmm. declare mm -hmm. their um, their view on that and they don't actually want to be mm -hmm. identified as such. Mm -hmm. that, and I guess this speaks to a, a broader in issue in academia, which mm -hmm. is that it's safer to kind of keep your head down mm -hmm. on a lot of these issues. So if you do want to kind of speak up and offer an, a position that's mm -hmm. like an alternative to mm -hmm. the, the orthodoxy on any kind of controversial issue mm -hmm. on your universities, then you're putting yourself, you're compromising mm -hmm. your career opportunities. Yeah. So... Um, you know, you might have a job, mm -hmm. right, but you might not um, get, let's say, a grant uh, through mm -hmm. if you sort of become known as, you know, or you might get that, you might not get, if you get heterodox yeah. academy, or if you, um, you might not get a promotion, yeah. right? So the academic job market is, um, I guess it's quite reliant on kind of informal mm -hmm. social net networks with other mm -hmm. academics. Mm -hmm. So you're more likely, to say, to get mm. a position mm. if you're kind of well-known yeah. and have established contacts. If you can right. collaborate with other people mm -hmm. um, then who are productive and in your field, mm -hmm. then you're more likely to get a grant than if you, say, are a bit of an outlier and right. you, people are a bit wary about the views that you hold, then they're less likely to want to collaborate with you. Okay. And that obviously restricts your, your career opportunities. Right. So the following you have, whether that's on Twitter or just, you know, media presence, that can affect your prospects? I think so, yeah. Mm. I mean, I've, I've definitely heard directly from, mm -hmm. as I said, I've, I've spoken to mm -hmm. quite a few academics about this. Mm -hmm. And um, 
I've heard on more than one occasion um, mm-hmm. academics who have said that they are kind of self-censoring on mm-hmm. social media mm-hmm. because they're they're concerned that it'll just affect their careers. And it's not as though they're sort of saying anything, you know, racist yeah. or sexist yeah. or anything mm-hmm. like that, but just kind of expressing these mm-hmm. views that might be um, unorthodox yeah. um, to like the... Mm-hmm. The, the conventional mm. wisdom within yeah. academia, yeah. then they're really seeing that that's something that they don't want to do because yeah. they're not going to be able to progress in their mm-hmm. careers. Mm-hmm. So again, I think this, it's kind of a soft cancellation mm-hmm. in a way because mm-hmm. they're not expressing their views. They're not mm-hmm. sort of um, participating fully within ac- the academic mm-hmm. debate. So, that's an issue. so let's get into some of these controversial opinions that some of these academics feel you know, so reluctant to share. Mm-hmm. I'm sure... Many of them probably aren't that controversial, right. in opinion. But yeah. what what are the mo- most common issues that academics don't want to talk about? So there's a few. I mean, <laughs> at the moment, kind of the trans one is obviously mm-hmm. a, a mm-hmm. big one just because mm-hmm. of how volatile it is. Mm-hmm. Um, and obviously we do have some academics mm-hmm. who are sort of outspoken mm-hmm. on it. We've got Holly Lofford-Smith, mm-hmm. who <laughs> call it mm-hmm. writer. Um, she's out, outspoken on it. Mm-hmm. and But she has faced consequences for doing yeah. that, right? Um, her institution has mm-hmm. investigated her. Yep. Mm-hmm. Um, she's had students and other mm-hmm. academics try to kind of cancel her mm-hmm. course, saying mm-hmm. that she shouldn't be teaching her course, yep. that she's not fit for it, despite Despite having you know a lot of mm-hmm. student reports mm-hmm. that say that she's actually a great mm-hmm. teacher and she does her best mm-hmm. to present, well, she does present mm-hmm. both sides of the mm-hmm. argument on mm-hmm. on these issues. There's the yeah. union as well, which That's I, right. I know you've been yeah. following on and reporting on quite quite well on um, Twitter. I'd love yeah. to get into that actually. Um, yeah. What is what's the union? The any the NT, so National Tertiary Education Union. Okay. That's essentially a union of, of academics and, mm-hmm. and university workers. Yeah, yeah, so anyone who works at a uni, really, like the yeah. admin, you know, managers, everyone, yeah. Yeah. and the, the teaching staff and Definitely. research staff. Yep. Okay. They're a massive union. Yeah, big union, mm-hmm. and they kind of took the position that um, – that there was very hostile to, to free speech okay. with regards to this issue of, of trans, um, yeah. trans rights and so on. So mm-hmm. essentially trying to kind of outlaw any expression of what you might call gender critical mm-hmm. views. These are the sort of views that Holly Lovett Smith mm-hmm. argues that, that actually sex mm-hmm. as a category is mm-hmm. important, not yes. just gender. Yes. And so that is now kind of seen as a, um, a hostile position mm-hmm. within the, the NTEU. Mm-hmm. So they've done their best to try to kind of silence that and say Mm -hmm. that you can't be members of the union. They won't support you if you um, do kind of hold those views. So, Mm -hmm. again, this is something that I feel that the NTU needs to be neutral on. Um, Mm -hmm. I don't think it should be having these kind of policies which are going to kind of demonise academics that just hold a different set of views. It might not be orthodox. It might Mm -hmm. not be the consensus, but it's still a legitimate point of view. And this is one side of the debate. And I think Mm -hmm. that they shouldn't be excluded from these Mm organisations or demonised in the way that they are. And, Mm -hmm. you know, the the same kind of goes for early career academics who Mm -hmm. they might be, they might be NTU members. um, But if you're an early career academic, Mm -hmm. which is very precarious, so Mm -hmm. you're often sort of chasing short term contracts, Mm -hmm. you know, and, and your job prospects are kind of dependent on your reputation mm-hmm. within academia. If you get a, um, a reputation as, say, a gender-critical feminist, then uh, your chances of getting a, a position in a department that doesn't support gender-critical views, right, mm-hmm. then your, your chances of getting a job there are, are mm-hmm. diminished, hugely diminished. So these things kind of these matter, and and I guess the signal that the NTU is saying is that that these gender critical views kind of amount to hate speech mm-hmm. and transphobia and so on. Whereas I think these, you know, I think these are legitimate points of view, mm-hmm. and they need to be sort of just recognised yeah. as such. And it's quite ironic, right? Because the the union is supposed it's traditionally for you know working class values right, yeah. and people and representing people's labour rights. Mm. Um, and a lot of these gender critical feminists are on the left. Yeah, they're like, yeah. you Old know, Marxist lefties. feminists yeah. or like socialists yeah. and they're being, um, you know, cast out of the union. So they have no representation by any union now, I suppose. Yeah. Um, and so that's, and that's a, that's a tough position to be in if mm. you feel as though you're going to be having to fight an, on an issue of academic freedom, mm. right, or unfair dismissal mm-hmm. or unjust treatment by a university or an mm. employer. You want the union to be there to back mm-hmm. you up um, mm-hmm. as you would for any other kind of mm-hmm. issue around workers' rights. Yeah. Um, but it's not clear that the union would do that because mm. of just the stance that it's taken mm. on this particular issue. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So it looks like they've been ideologically 
captured. Yeah, I mean, I think so. Yeah, mm. certainly, there's been a, a, a substantial sort of deviation away from what you might call traditional worker rights, mm. and it does seem to kind of be an attempt to move towards this more identity politics mm-hmm. idea around workers' mm. rights. And are there any other? institutions aside from universities themselves that are affecting the everyday lives of academics or researchers? I mean, I think this this issue of ideological capture is mm-hmm. tricky, right? It's mm-hmm. hard to say whether an organisation is captured mm-hmm. or not. You know, I, I, I've seen recently the Australian Academy of mm-hmm. um, Social Science and mm-hmm. the Australian Academy of Science, mm-hmm. both kind of highly respected organisations devoted to science and social science respectively mm-hmm. and sort of putting knowledge out there, um, communicating um, the best science and social science that they can. They've taken positions on this voice to parliament, right, mm. in support of it. And you know, other organisations like the Australian Sociological Association did similar things in the past for the, the um, same-sex marriage postal survey, okay. right? So these are big national debates mm-hmm. where th- there's debate within the community yes. about what the, the appropriate mm-hmm. course is. I don't feel as though those organisations should be taking those kind of taking positions on these debates, taking Mm -hmm. explicit positions on these debates. Mm -hmm. I think they should be um, promoting the debate itself Mm -hmm. rather than saying this is what we should do. And and I think in a way it's sort of trying to leverage the position and the public trust that science has and and trust Mm -hmm. in science from within the community. Mm -hmm. It's it's trying to leverage that towards a kind of a political end. Mm -hmm. So regardless of whether or not you support the voice, I Mm -hmm. think they shouldn't be um, mm. kind of participating in the yep. debate to the extent that they are. And mm. uh, I what think do they be get better. out of it? Why are they doing it? Just <laughs> yeah. like virtue signaling? Yeah, maybe. I mean, I just, I think there's a desire for a lot of people in um, professional occupations to mm. kind of let their inner activist kind of mm-hmm. out and, and these kind of institutions mm-hmm. are a vehicle to do that. Mm-hmm. So, it, you know, you can get a lot more people to listen to you mm-hmm. if you get your organization, Mm -hmm. you know, a university or whatever association to kind of take a formal stance on these issues than if just you, the individual, Mm -hmm. say I support it. And so, but I do think it kind of can undermine the public trust in those institutions, um, which, you know, we need people to trust science, right, when they're producing Mm -hmm. good science. Um, And I I just think that when you're taking these political positions Mm -hmm. and, you know, particularly when it's not really a scientific mm-hmm. issue. Mm-hmm. I don't see the voice mm-hmm. to parliament, for instance, as a scientific issue. Mm-hmm. I think it's, it's a political issue. Mm-hmm. Um, and again, I don't think this means that, you know, there's either way is, mm-hmm. is right or wrong. Mm-hmm. I just think that it's not a scientific issue mm-hmm. and so they shouldn't be taking a side. Yeah. And are there any countries that are doing it better, countries that we can look at for inspiration when it comes to viewpoint diversity in universities? It's it's tricky. Mm-hmm. I mean, so there are there's definitely stuff happening in the US. Mm-hmm. I don't know if I entirely support it. I mean, mm-hmm. where they're they're kind of mandating um, kind of quotas for, as I understand it, like right of center academics, right? Okay. Interesting. Which you know, it's and and using kind of every kind of legal means and executive means to do that. Is that in Florida? That, I think it's in Florida. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. Um, and so. You know, that that to me seems to be an extreme measure mm-hmm. because if you are willing to use, like, the power of the government mm-hmm. to shape an institution like mm-hmm. a university in your mm-hmm. kind of your, the image that you want it mm-hmm. to be, then that really just opens the door to it being shaped to another exactly. vision that you don't support. Yeah, yeah like if, if you don't support quotas for other other reasons, you can't support yeah. it, just political yeah. reasons either, yeah. Yeah, and so that's my concern is that I do think that um, you know, we, we need to make sure that the universities are, are independent mm-hmm. of government kind of interference, right? But at the same time, we also need to recognise that if they they are kind of do have this ideological drift, then and you know, or ideological capture in mm-hmm. some cases, then we need to be able to recognise that. And I, I would rather the universities kind of took it upon themselves to to recognise this as an issue, mm-hmm. rather than kind of. Um, you know, having having the government interfere and say you've got to do something about this, I, th- I think it's much more productive if this is sort of recognised from within, mm-hmm. change coming from within as mm-hmm. opposed to from externally. Yeah, and speaking of change coming from within, we both know Alan Davison from UTS, who's um, been doing some great work um, at UTS uh, with Josh Zepps as well. Yeah. Um, so I guess there's. There is room to for brave individuals. Um, yeah. 
although as we know that can have consequences yeah. it can it can be tricky and i guess yeah. part of it is um a lot of these people as i said this this issue of people not wanting to kind of stick mm-hmm. their head up and mm-hmm. identify themselves mm-hmm. as that and also being in positions of power to mm-hmm. actually kind of promote this so it's one thing for you to be a you know like a just a mid career just an average lecturer mm-hmm. um but it's difficult to kind of influence the institution mm-hmm. much. Mm-hmm. But if you're in a position of power within the university mm-hmm. and you're able to kind of be in a position to say, you know, bring in these speakers who might offer a different perspective, mm-hmm. um, then that's, you know, that's sort of, mm-hmm. it's going to have more of an effect in terms of shaping the institution mm-hmm. towards heterodox views. Mm. And in your experience, is this something that students also are interested in? Do any students join Heterodox Academy, yeah. I wonder, or follow? I can't remember if they have student members now. Mm-hmm. I think they do. Um, it started out as a, a kind of an organisation that just had mm-hmm. professors, mm-hmm. right? And then they opened it up to postdocs, which okay. is people who aren't kind of, they're not full academics okay. quite yet, but they still have a PhD. Um, and then they've opened it up to, to students now, mm-hmm. I think. Yeah, so it is something that students are mm-hmm. aware of. Mm-hmm. Um, I think a lot of students are a lot smarter than mm-hmm. perhaps they a lot of people would think and they recognize that in, in certain subjects if you write the wrong thing if you aren't kind of they, they're able to kind of understand what needs to be written mm. to in order to get a mark or a pass mm-hmm. in a course if they understand that the the lecturer has a particular point of view yes and they would, it's it's much better for them in terms of their marks mm-hmm. to kind of repeat that view back to the lecturer rather than offering a, a different point of view mm-hmm. so um I do think students, yeah, are aware of it, and mm-hmm. I think it's it's something that again they can communicate as well, right? Mm-hmm. To the to the universities, they're paying for the degrees, mm-hmm. and come some cases a lot of money to do that, and it's in their interests uh, as much as the universities to uh, to have uh, you know diverse viewpoints expressed mm-hmm. in their their lecturers, mm-hmm. and, and you know in terms of getting feedback on the the material that mm-hmm. they submit, mm-hmm. and beyond the university setting. Um, what? Why do you think viewpoint diversity is important for, you know, Australia or people in general? Like, sell it to someone who thinks yeah. that they yeah. have the right opinion. Yeah. As I used to think, you know, I was very much a yeah. social justice warrior and I thought, no, I have the right opinion. Mm. And if you don't agree with me, then you're on the wrong side of history. And, you know, how would you sell someone on viewpoint diversity? I think it's important for kind of for a lot of organisations, mm-hmm. right? Particularly if they're dealing in any kind of um, well issue of of around knowledge work mm-hmm. or knowledge production mm-hmm. or any kind of cultural issue mm-hmm. to have diverse viewpoints. Mm-hmm. Because if you, um, like I said before at mm-hmm. the start, if you are only engaging with people that think like you, mm-hmm. you're going to have blind spots. Mm-hmm. Okay, you're all you're going to have very similar blind spots in the things that you aren't thinking about, you aren't recognising. Uh, you're not going to be um, your people who are sort of sense checking mm-hmm. your work, mm-hmm. um, the organisation's work, aren't going to be picking up on the things that that, that it should be. Mm-hmm. So I think any kind of organisation should be committed to um, having diverse viewpoints. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's it's sort of one of the cornerstones of of knowledge mm-hmm. production that mm-hmm. you you have people, and that's I guess that's part of the reason of we have peer review, right? Mm-hmm. Is that you you don't just rely on your own sort of view of your own work, yeah. right? Because you've got these biases and things mm-hmm. that you're going to overlook, you rely on someone else to um, to pick up those things. Mm-hmm. And that's what the review process is all about. Mm-hmm. That that kind of breaks down when they think very similarly to you. Mm-hmm. Whereas if they ask sort of thinking differently mm-hmm. and are able to offer a better critique, then mm-hmm. it's just going to have better outcomes. Mm-hmm. I guess it sort of gets me into the question too. I'm not sure if you want to talk about it, mm-hmm. but about Jordan Peterson. I'm not sure, sure if you've been following it, but um, I guess the Jordan Peterson situation is a bit different because he's, um, you know, a licensed, he was psychologist. a licensed psychologist. Yeah. Mm. So it's a bit different. It's more in the medical sphere. Yeah. Um, but yeah, what what do you think? Do you think that these organisations should have any control over what their members do, believe, yeah, say? Um so I think, yeah, social media, this is a whole kind of new realm, yeah. right? Social mm-hmm. media, I guess academics haven't, and, and everyone, we haven't had this capacity to publicly kind of express our views mm-hmm. and have a, a views out there on mm-hmm. the, for everyone to see mm-hmm. and for, to critique um, in the past. Mm-hmm. So for academics in particular, social media is a really kind of fraught space mm-hmm. because um, at the same time, you, you're you'd see academics, they'll be promoting their kind of professional work, so their papers and projects and grants and things, but they'll kind of be mixing that in 
with um, kind of just everyday political personal views stuff. and personal yeah. views yeah. on on things, and so there's that fusion of the mm. the professional and the personal. Mm. And so it's hard to kind of separate those out, right? I think in the case of academics who, um, you know, might be saying some controversial mm-hmm. things on on Twitter or social media, and they have, I think they sh- they should absolutely have that right. Um, from the organisation's point of view, right? Say an organisation is concerned that one of their employees is expressing um, views that they themselves don't support, mm-hmm. and the organisation's kind of role attached to mm-hmm. that online profile. Mm-hmm. I can see why the the universities or organisations would be reluctant to mm-hmm. have that their their kind of name branded mm-hmm. over that view mm-hmm. in a way, and so I, I think you know I, I've been thinking about this a little bit. I, mm-hmm. I think the kind of the best compromise there is for that academic in the case of academic freedom to keep saying what they're doing. I do think that if they're kind of asked to kind of tone down their association with that university mm-hmm. with the, with their employer. I don't yeah. think that's a totally unreasonable request mm-hmm. um, because, again, like I think that that academic who is – if they're sort of using their institutional mm-hmm. profile mm-hmm. to, say, gain a following, right, to say that I'm, a, I'm a, um, an employee of Harvard, I'm a, a professor at, say, Harvard or Princeton, some prestigious institution mm-hmm. – and I'm expressing these these views, right? Mm-hmm. Then they're trying to leverage the university to mm-hmm. raise their profile. But if those views aren't really in alignment with that, then I, I think they should be free to continue to express those views. Mm-hmm. But I think that this is one area where they maybe that's sort of the compromise okay. is, is sort of removing that obvious public, obvious yeah, public connection, connection mm-hmm. to the university mm-hmm. because I think they're, they're still going to be a professor regardless of whether or yeah. not they're at that university mm-hmm. or not. Mm-hmm. Um, so... That's, those are my early thoughts on okay. it again, yeah. So <laughs> some room for some compromise, a little compromise. I think so. Yeah. Holly might have a different view, though. Yeah. But well, we'll, we'll have to it. see. <laughs> I'm seeing her at our, at our social in Melbourne this month, which nice. I'm very excited about. We've sold out of tickets, everyone. I'm very sorry if you don't have a ticket. You've missed out. Too late. <laughs> I guess you won't be there, Andrew, because you don't live. Yeah. Melbourne. It's tricky yeah. to get to. I'll see you at yeah. our next Sydney one. That sounds good. Which hasn't been planned yet, but. I'll get onto it. That'll be it. Thank you so much for joining me today. No worries. Thanks, Zoe. It's been a pleasure. Yeah, likewise. See ya.